no such thing in the world anymore as a permanent job. I am on a contract until the day I retire, but if the university was decide that I was no longer needed, they would make me redundant. That is not a bad thing, by the way. Can I say that this is actually quite liberating when you realise this and there is no such thing as a job for life anymore? Because it means that you can change direction, you can change what you're doing and you can actually decide to do different things. It means that you're in the driving seat and you're in control. So it's actually a good thing that there's no longer sort of a permanent job as such. So I'm going to take you through some of the highlights and lowlights of so my career and how I got to this position of being an academic. The first thing is that I did a degree, as most people do. I went to university to study chemistry. Now, for those that know you know me pretty well, I have a bit of a tremor. I'm very slightly, because a condition called dyspraxia, which I have, which means I have a bit of a tremor. Chemistry with a tremor was not a good idea. And I don't really know why nobody ever told me that before I went to university. So what happened is I went to university at 17. It, on my 18th birthday, I was distilling acid. I smashed the distillation tube and poured acid into the cut, which was not fun. And I still have a scar on my hand from doing that. Thankfully, it looks a bit like one of the lines, so you can't really tell. And I decided at that point that chemistry wasn't for me. And I even thought about dropping out of university because I was so like, I had this plan and the plan's gone. What do I do now? Thankfully, I didn't drop out there and then. I had a great advisor of studies who's still a good friend of mine who I went and spoke to and said, yeah, chemistry is not for me. And he said, well, you're doing other subjects. So what are you doing? What do you enjoy? And I said, well, I'm, I'm really quite enjoying this maths course I'm doing. So we'll go and study maths then. So I changed to do a maths degree. As part of that, I got to do a bit of computing and I really liked the computing side. So I graduated as an undergraduate maths degree. And then I went on to do a PhD in artificial intelligence computing because that was the bit that was really fascinating me at that point. The PhD, I have to say, it went fairly well. Quite a lot of people have got horror stories from the PhD, but I had a fantastic supervisor. And my main advice on doing a PhD is choose a supervisor more than you choose the project. Because you actually want to have a supervisor who's a great person who you're actually going to enjoy being supervised by. She was wonderful, got through the PhD. Part of my PhD, I went and done an internship at NASA. I don't know if you can tell, but that is a NASA logo on my fleece there, which was a fantastic experience. Something that I learned a lot from that I still use in my career today about how to work in huge teams, how to work online, how to work across, across the USA. And then I won the BSA Computing Award for the Young IT Practitioner of the Year back in 2004. Yes, I'm that old. That's the year I finished my PhD. Um, interestingly, I got a bit of stick for winning that award from my fellow PhD students, some of whom I think in retrospect were a bit jealous and I'm beginning to even wonder if I should have put myself forward for an award like that. I'm beginning to think, have I been pushing myself too much? If you ever feel like that, that is not the case. You are definitely not pushing yourself forward too much. If I hadn't got this award, I wouldn't have gone on to the fantastic career I've got now. It really helped open doors, got me my first postdoc, which was in the USA, did another postdoc in Ireland. So having these awards, having these experiences is really what opened my, opened my doors to me and allowed me to carry on my career. So do it. Then everything went slightly wrong. And this is maybe a slightly weird way for things to go wrong. So this is a picture of my wedding cake. You can tell, yes, I am a geek. Um, I fell in love and decided to get married. And that was never in my plans in the slightest. He lived in a different country to me. So all of a sudden I was in the situation where I was like, well, I kind of want to be in the same country as Chris, my now husband. How do I do that? And I have to say, I did something I never thought I'd do, which is I slightly compromised on my career in order to be in the same country as the person I wanted to be in. You know what? That wasn't a bad thing to do at all in retrospect, because it made me happy. And as far as I'm concerned, really all we do in life is about trying to be happy. And actually, it was a slight blip on the career. It meant that for about a year, I didn't have an academic job. I took a different job. But it actually meant that I learned different things from that skill set than I would have done if I just carried on in this academic career and trajectory. And now when I teach, I can talk about that year I spent in industry. I can talk about these NASA experiences. So I think having these blips has actually made me a far better lecturer. I've now been in St Andrews and uni Dundee University for 10 years. I started my journey in St Andrews, but now in Dundee. Um, and 
I also never really expected to stay in one place for this long. But when you get married, you have this thing that we call the two-body problem in academia. And actually, my husband works at St. Andrews University. That's why I said St. Andrews earlier. I work at Dundee, and it just works well. And so actually, rather than moving universities I expected to do, what I've done instead is climbed my career and built my career at Dundee University to the point where I'm now Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching, a job which I have to say has been horrendously difficult this summer, but I really, really enjoy because I enjoy working with students. I enjoy the communication challenges of that. And so I've got to where I am today by this mix of a little bit of planning, but also sometimes just deciding to do what makes me happy and enjoying the journey I've been on as opposed to actually always following the path that I'd chosen to thought I'd chosen to follow. And I'll stop there. Thanks all for listening. Thank you so much, Karen. That's so interesting. Next up, we have Margie Vilney. Okay, thanks, Guy. I'm hoping you can see my slides. Uh, so, thanks very much for inviting me. I am really excited. I'm excited because I think that the Women in STEM Society is doing amazing stuff. So I'm delighted to be part of it. Uh, I'm also delighted because on this panel of amazing lecturers, and even though I've not been at Dundee Uni that long, and we're all from different disciplines, I have already been supported and worked with everyone on the panel. So it's really exciting for me. Um, when I was told to discuss my career in five minutes, that was when the real challenge hit. But it's been good in a way because it's made me reflect uh, on what has shaped my career and what's been important. So I've called it the long road, maybe less taken. So usually Continuing with that uh, Chinese theme, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You know, usually you start off, you have some career aspirations, that's the beginning of your career, how you want it to look, uh, and then you find yourself in your current career. And for most people, I hope that it's a reasonably straight line. You might have some blips along the way. For me, I feel that my career has looked something like this. Uh, but I'll start, I'll make it easy. I'll start with where I am now. So point B. Right now, I'm a lecturer in structural engineering uh, at the University of Dundee, and I'm also the director for public engagement and outreach for the School of Science and Engineering. Uh, I've got a PhD, MSc research, BSc, all in structural engineering and a PG cert in higher education teaching. I'm also a chartered engineer with the Institution of Civil Engineers. I'm a proved mentor if anybody needs one a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy, a member of Tayside and Fife IC committee. And as of Friday, I have been elected as the vice chair of the executive board of the Council of Military uh, Academic Committees. Uh, and I believe I'm the first woman. So my job really entails three main parts. The first is teaching related, developing and teaching structural engineering on the graduate apprenticeship. Uh, the second is research related. It, my research deals with computational mechanics, uh, mainly structures under blast and impact um, and protective structures and outreach related. Obviously, now this is part of my job. But regardless, I am passionate about promoting diversity in STEM. So how did it all start then? I thought I'd I thought about this a bit and I thought about my first things. So my first love was Lego, right? No moving parts for me. I'm definitely a structural civil engineer. Uh, my first engineering dispute was probably around the age of three or four with my dad, who's also a structural engineer, uh, where I still maintain, by the way, that I'm right. We had an argument over if the Eiffel Tower was a tower or a bridge. Um, and I think that shaped me in the fact that I wasn't shut down. I was allowed to explore these ideas, perhaps have a slightly different point of view. Uh, and I was very lucky. I went to a really great school and I finished first in my year in maths, physics and chemistry. So you would think that my first professional role would be quite straightforward. 
But in fact, it wasn't. My parents moved to Israel when I was a teenager. So my first professional role was actually this. Uh, I started off as a private uh, in the Israeli military and I was a welfare officer. But the good thing about this is it really opened my eyes to people from different backgrounds. I got exposed to so many things that I don't think I would have ever seen otherwise. So starting from that, uh, I was a welfare officer. I finished with a commission, with a captain's commission. I went on to do a BSc and a MSc research in structural engineering. I was quite lucky because I got to explore how to protect historical structures using innovative technologies. I was a teaching assistant as well. Uh, and then I was offered a scholarship at Harriet Watt to investigate um, concrete columns under blast loads. During that time, I did take a break. I had my first child. And after coming back, I started feeling a bit disillusioned with academia. You know, was there any point to my research? Was anybody going to read it? Why am I doing this? Uh, and so I looked for a job and I became a structural engineer uh, in an oil and gas division advanced analysis team. I was still working towards my PhD and now I was also working towards chartership. Uh, in 2013, I took my second maternity leave and after I came back around 2015 was probably the hardest time in my life. Oil and gas was not doing so well, so job prospects were not great. There was not a great atmosphere in my office. I was working towards all these things, chartership, PhD. I was working a minimum of 40 hours a week at work and also receiving comments like this. The problem is you, that you keep on having all these babies and why do you need a promotion? You have so much more in life, you have a baby. Now I can't hear you, but I am sure that you're all gasping in horror. Uh, but this really hard time made me take a step back and reflect on what I wanted out of life. And in 2016, I became the program leader for the BSc in civil engineering uh, and lecturing in structural engineering at Abate University. I submitted my PhD, I passed my chartership exams, and I earned a PG cert in higher education all in the space of those two years. So it's quite a busy time, but I had, uh, I had the energy, I was rejuvenated. Uh, and in January this year, I moved, as you know, to Dundee University uh, as a lecturer and director for public engagement, which role I got in uh, May. So before I finish, I just thought I'd give a few words of advice. Uh, most of it, you know, I wish I'd followed myself. But I would say definitely join supportive networks. I mean, the Women in STEM Society is an example, but other societies, if you're in Scotland, equate Scotland and network. Find a mentor champion. Find a supportive network for yourself. And I think that is important. I think we all should support each other. I think that is really important. I want to celebrate everybody's achievements. Uh, get involved with the professional institutions, CPD, especially in engineering, start thinking about chartership, take advantage of career advice, educate yourself on the reality of a career in STEM. And maybe the most important, if you do have any concerns, voice them early. There's a huge network that would really like to hear your concerns. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. That's some journey. Yeah. Next up, we have yes. Karen Mayer. Can you see my slides okay? Yep. Okay, thank you, uh, Sky and the Women in STEM Society, for inviting me to take part in this panel. Um, I feel really privileged to be here with my amazing colleagues and it's already been really fascinating to hear from them. On this slide here, I've just listed um, the topics that it was suggested I talk about in this short overview. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover. So first of all, how did I get into STEM? As you can see, um, my parents encouraged me to explore a diverse range of topics from a young age. I'd say my dad was my main inspiration to study science. Um, he'd do science experiments with us in the kitchen. He'd wake us up in the middle of the night to see a lunar eclipse or a meteor shower. 
And my mum is really responsible for my love of sci-fi. Um, I chose to study mathematics at the University of Edinburgh for my undergraduate. And during that time, I had the opportunity to do a summer research project in modelling globular star cluster evolution. And this was my first taste of research and a large part of what influenced me to want to do a PhD. And my supervisor was really great as well. Um, when we had meetings, he'd often go off on a tangent and just tell me cool stuff about astronomy. Um, so I think he, he and himself was really inspiring as well as the project. I then went to the University of St Andrews um, to undertake a PhD in applied mathematics with a focus on numerical modelling within solar physics. Um, again, I was lucky to work with a great supervisor. Uh, as Karen mentioned earlier, I think this is really important if it's something that you're considering doing. And I still collaborate with him now and I see him as kind of um, an official mentor. I stayed on in St Andrews as a postdoc for a couple of years. And during that time, I asked to do some lecturing and research project supervision for experience. So I was given the opportunity to lecture part of one of the first year mathematics modules, which was just over 100 students. And I was also given the opportunity to supervise a summer research project student. And um, this gave me uh, experience of applying for funding for the first time as well, applying to the Royal Society of Edinburgh for one of their vacation scholarships. I then moved to Abertay for my first uh, lecturing position. It was a teaching focused university, so my research took a hit, but it was a permanent position or as permanent as academic positions can be um, in a location that I wanted to be. And um, something that Karen mentioned earlier um, kind of made me think about this as well. I think the most important thing to me as well is to be happy. I, was, I wasn't sure at the time whether I made the right choice in moving to Abertay. The kind of expected thing to do if I wanted to be an academic would have been to um, take on various postdoctoral positions, possibly not even in the UK. But I wanted to be in Fife, Dundee area. And as I said, it was a permanent position. So it was a, a good job for me, a good choice for me at the time. I was teaching maths to games programming students. So it was quite different to what I was used to. And incidentally, the gender balance um, on the games programming course was very poor. I was lucky to have even one or two girls in a typical class size of 40. It was a very diverse school that I was located in, delivering degrees in all aspects of computer games development and in cybersecurity. And this meant that um, it was a very diverse group of academics. We had programmers, designers, artists, people from industry, only two mathematicians. But this interdisciplinary environment gave me the opportunity to work on projects that I wouldn't have otherwise. So examples of these are um, I worked on a game that was built around a mathematical model for the treatment of tuberculosis. I supervised a PhD student who was doing research in real time interactive fluid simulation. And I started a collaboration with colleagues applying machine learning techniques for feature detection within um, my own research interest, which is solar physics. But I missed being in a maths department and I joined Dundee in February of this year. And now that I'm here, I plan to continue my research in solar physics, as well as explore further the application of machine learning within my field by engaging with the fantastic computer vision and image processing group that they have here at the University of Dundee. So the last two things I was uh, suggested to talk about are any hardships faced and advice to students. And I would say that the main hardship I have faced is that I'm my own worst enemy. I constantly question my ability and whether I'm good enough to be here. And my main advice to students would be um, to try things out and find out what really interests you. I'd say my whole life I've never really had a plan or known what I wanted to do. And it's only in the last few years that I have felt more certain about that. And I personally feel most fulfilled when I'm doing something that I enjoy. So just to echo Karen's talk from earlier, um, for me, I think the most important thing is to be happy. Thank you, Karen. Next up, we have Anna Lou Waller. Hello, everybody. I hope you can see me. I'm going to share just a few slides. 
we don't say a lot, but they give me a bit of a backdrop to work with. What I'd like to talk to you about is the fact that nothing we do, oops, nothing we do is actually planned. Everything I've done in my life has actually just fallen into place. My talk is a bit different from other people in that I'm going to tell you a bit about growing up as a disabled girl. I was born with cerebral palsy, but no one knew that until I was quite old, about eight months old. And it was my mother who actually looked at me and said, you will never be able to cope physically, so the thing that we will work on is your brain, and you will go to university. But she thought that I would be a background person out of the limelight with nobody actually having to listen to me. How wrong could she have been? So I ended up doing mathematics in secondary school and mathematics ended up being my favorite subject the subject that I was the best at. The problem was that nobody knew what to do with me. How could a disabled um, girl do something like engineering or even write maths if she couldn't write? Now, in the 1980s, this was the late 70s, 80s, there was something called computer, sci computer science. And I had gone to watch Star Wars. And guess what I wanted to do? I wanted to build a robot. And that actually led me into the field of computing, led me into university, where I did a BSc in computer science. And then I couldn't get a job, because no one would employ someone who would scare all the other people she worked with. So I ended up giving a master's in rehabilitation engineering and ended up being a computer scientist who develops assistive technology for disabled people. Slowly but surely, I went and did my PhD and then got into teaching and lecturing and have ended up as the head of the department for computing at Andy. Who would have thought that a child who was destined to be a research librarian would end up as a computer scientist. So nothing is ever what it seems. Thank you. What an inspirational story, Anna Lou. Thank you. Next up, we have Aurora Cecilia Aguilar. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, so I'm not sharing any slides. So, uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me here. 
So uh, my story about uh, how I came to what I am now is a bit similar to what other people have been telling about. So I'm also a lecturer at the University of Dundee. I'm a lecturer in physics and uh, my research is in the field of astrophysics. And uh, it's a curious story because uh, I somehow I ended up doing things that I wanted to do from a very early stage. So I also had a lot of support when growing up from my family. Uh, I had a lot of um, uh, discussions about the science, mostly with my mother, also with uh, my grandfather, although no one was a scientist in my family. I grew up uh, making experiments in the kitchen, uh, trying to see how ice melted, uh, how a, a candle was suck uh, air from the... Um, uh, when you put it in a glass. Also, my grandfather used to like to talk a lot about uh, astronomy. So he used to talk about uh, solar eclipses. He also was telling about comets, how he was unlucky enough to miss the Comet Halley, not once, but twice, which is a very bad thing to happen because there are not many people that get a chance to see it once and uh, to miss it twice is not nice. Uh, and then essentially I grew up with this uh, kind of environment where talking about science and talking about astrophysics or astronomy was a normal thing. Although my initial reaction with astrophysics was actually to be scared of the stars. So as a child, I thought this is uh, like such an immense universe. It's sort of, uh, if I get out at night, it looks like I'm going to fall outwards and get lost in the universe. So it was uh, what uh, initially was a scary thing. But I also got to, to talk, talk uh, to talk to my grandparents, to my mother, a bit to my father as well about these sort of topics. My father is a captain of a ship, so he used to also show constellations and uh, kind of uh, tell a bit about positional astronomy. And uh, one of the episodes that I remember as a child, I must have been in nursery, was that I saw a, a rainbow, but it was a rainbow that was around the sun, actually, instead of being a rainbow that was uh, uh, on the opposite side. So this is uh, what you call a halo around the sun, right? Only that halos are very rare where I come from. I come from southern Spain and uh, Andalusian. And uh, that was one of the things that stayed in my mind because I went and talked to my mother and I said, well, I saw a rainbow around the sun. And she said, well, but rainbows are opposite to the sun. And uh, somehow I couldn't explain this, right? I kept coming back, asking teachers, uh, how comes we see a rainbow around the sun? And no one could really find that out until I was about 11. And then because I was reading essentially any book that was lying about at home, I came through some of the books on meteorology from my father and just flipping through the pages, I saw a halo. And it was, oh, this is what I always knew that was there. And uh, no one could explain it. I found it so exciting. So I kept uh, thinking about science. I kept measuring temperatures and doing things. And then, uh, well, I went and... Um, when it went to, to, to go to university, I went to do physics with a view of uh, my intention was to do astrophysics at some point. So uh, I didn't feel weird when I went into physics, mostly because I may have been lucky, but at the Autonomous University of Madrid, where I went, we had probably about 35 or 40 percent of women or girls in class. So it didn't feel any, anything strange. And then also... I went to do theoretical physics, and in the theoretical physics department, uh, there were actually, uh, from the astrophysics side, there were two women and two men as lecturers, all that about that respectable age. Uh, and then also there were the particle physics people where there were several women, so I never felt like this was strange. And uh, I kept doing physics, and then I, I, I did quite well. I, I, I finished first uh, in Spain in my year, and this uh, I managed to, to get a... Um, a scholarship to do a PhD. Uh, I got a scholarship from the from the Smithsonian Society. I went to do a PhD at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Boston. And then I, I spent there a few years doing my PhD and taking exams back in Spain. I did a lot of observing. I went to Hawaii to observe the telescopes. I also spent a lot of time in Arizona observing there. I was very happy. And then after I finished my PhD, I, uh, I also... Uh, I also got married to my husband, and then things started getting a bit complicated, as people have mentioned. Uh, I went to work as a postdoc in uh, Heidelberg in Germany because we had the intention of uh, sort of going back to, to, to Europe at some point. Uh, at the point, my husband was uh, 
in the US. And then he managed to move to Switzerland. This looked like uh, this is just across the cor- uh, around the corner, although it was 250 kilometers. And uh, then things got even harder because then we got two children, one in 2008 and the other one in 2010. And then we realized that having 300 kilometers in between us with two children wasn't a practical thing. So we started, we started dealing with the many body problem. And uh, I first managed to get a lecturer position in Spain at my original university in Madrid. And uh, my husband moved there as a postdoc. But then we started kind of hitting a an end uh, to the road uh, because he couldn't get a permanent position or any kind of tenure track position there. He was already getting a bit too old for many of these grants have a, a, a number of years after PhD that you can apply. And then he got a position in San Andreas. So then what do I do? I kept a year going crazy, teaching in, um, in Madrid, living in San Andreas was not nice. And then I, I, I ended up as a postdoc in San Andreas. So that was like a step back. And, uh, and then after some uh, issues, I ended up being able to, 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 to move as a lecturer in Dundee in 2017. In the middle of this thing, I also got another third child born in 2015. So uh, I also felt uh, very identified with the comments that Marky was citing because I also got this thing of, uh, why do you have so many children? No wonder your situation is complicated. You have too many children, right? And... Um, yeah, this was uh, this has been one of the hardest things in my career actually to try to make a career where you can be together with your partner. Now we are happy because he's in San Andreas doing physics, I'm in Dundee doing astrophysics. So all the situation seems to be much better now. And uh, and the interesting thing is also that uh, as a child I started wondering about rainbows, and I'm still working on spectroscopy of stars to try to understand the very young stars when they are forming and the planets are around them. And at the end, this is also looking at rainbows again. So I wanted to look at rainbows when I was four and still looking at rainbows and finding a lot of interesting things. So although my career has been, uh, ha- hasn't been has been easy, and then actually if I had known that it was so hard, I don't know what I would have done. But it somehow it worked out and uh, I'm very happy about it. And uh, another thing that I wanted to tell for girls trying to think about uh, doing science is that uh, it doesn't, although in some countries you see very few girls, in some others that is not so few. Like uh, I never realized that there were few girls doing physics until I went to Germany. So that that, uh, means that it's definitely possible to do a career in science and uh, to study physics and any kind of science. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aurora. It's great to see how passionate you are about your subject. Last but not least, we have Shanine McDougall. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, I'll just pop my video on. Um, so, thank you very much uh, for inviting me along. I'm absolutely uh, thrilled to be here. Um, and can I just say before I even start on my story, it's just absolutely amazing to hear everyone else's stories because I've worked with um, a lot of the panel quite closely and um, hearing the backstories is just, it's it's quite inspiring um, to me. So hopefully it's in, in, inspiring a few of the the people listening as well. Um, so my story, I'm a lecturer in anatomy um, at the University of Dundee, so within the CAHID um, department, part of the School of Science and Engineering. I, um, I'm the anatomy lead for the medical programme, so I mainly work with medical students, um, although I do work with uh, dental students and a little bit with science students as well. And I'm also the lead for um, public public engagement and equality and diversity in CAHID. So lots of different um, passions all intertwined in, in one. Um, my journey into STEM, again, very similar to a lot of people, didn't, um, you know, didn't really have a kind of plan as such. I kind of fell into it. Uh, had fantastic um, female teachers at high school, particularly my biology teacher, Uh, Mrs Martin, remembered her well, and um, she kind of really sparked a a passion for biology um, in general, um, and more so about the the kind of the human body. When I started 
applying to go to university, I actually applied to Dundee University to do law um, and got into do law. And one of the reasons was because around about that time, one of my uh, dad's good friends had just kind of finished law and had become a lawyer. He'd done it a little bit later in life and had started working. And, you know, he came up with all these stories. It sounded amazing. It sounded like something I would, you know, really quite like to do. And so I applied to do law and got the acceptance. And the closer and closer we got to start in first year, I just thought, no, this is it's not it's not me. It's not what I want to do. My interest and my passion has always been in biology and in particular anatomy. So I uh, phoned up uh, registry and asked if it was possible to swap courses. And I think they were a bit shocked when I asked um, when I uh, said what it was that I wanted to um, to swap to. Um, but thankfully, they did let me into the anatomical sciences course. And the rest for me is kind of history, I suppose. Um, I got my BSc in anatomical sciences. And just as I was finishing, uh, we had just started the uh, master's in forensic anthropology. At that time, it was called human identification. So that was a, a brand new course just the year before I finished. So I went on to do my master's um, here. And then um, basically what happened was I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do after that. So like a, like a kind of few people have said, they didn't have this clear plan. And my advisor of studies at the time, Dr. Dawson, sat me down and said, you know, I know that you really like anatomy. You you know, I'd always done quite well in anatomy classes. And he said, why don't you come in and be a demonstrator for a while? And I thought that's quite a good idea while I plan what I want to do. So I basically became a kind of almost full time demonstrator for about a year. And in that time, I was applying for PhD funding um, unfortunately, around about that time, it uh, was kind of the middle of the recession. There wasn't a lot of funding out there. And eventually I um, thought, no, I have to start getting real. It's not looking like I'm going to get PhD funding. And so I started applying for jobs. I went down to work as an anatomy technician at the uh, Royal College of Surgeons in London. Um, and I had a fantastic time down there, a really amazing time, loved the people, loved the job, but knew it wasn't what I wanted to do long term. I, I much preferred um, the, the kind of the academic side, the helping to kind of teach people side and helping them understand about the human body. And so, again, I started looking for PhD funding. I kind of knew then that that's, that's what I definitely wanted to do. And I was kind of going to fight all the way to do it. Um, came back up to Dundee. I'm a bit like a boomerang. They say I keep kind of leaving Dundee and coming back again. And came back, I got a, a job up at Nine Wells Hospital in the medical school um, in the exams office for the medical students. Um, and eventually was successful in uh, securing PhD funding to do my PhD back in Cahid. <laughs> so like I said, a bit of a bit of a boomerang. Um, completed my PhD so it was in uh, teal embalming so we had uh, recently started this new type of embalming all about teal embalming uh, a kind of soft fix so the cadavers are much more flexible um, and there hadn't been a lot of um, a lot of research into the, the effects of the teal embalming on the tissue itself so we knew that the tissues and things were flexible but we didn't know why and um, so that was kind of my area. It was it was a difficult PhD to do because no one had really looked much at it before. I think when I first started, there was one other paper out there about it. So it was quite difficult. But again, I had the support of some fantastic uh, mentors, both PhD mentors and just generally within CAHID. Um, just before I finished my PhD, I also got married. So the year before I finished my PhD, I got married um, and thankfully, my husband was based in Dundee anyway, so that, that didn't kind of cause the the, the usual problem. Um, but I finished the PhD, and just as I was finishing, there was a maternity um, cover up um, in the in the department for an anatomy lecturer, and thankfully, was successful in getting that. 
Uh, the person then decided that they weren't coming back. So again, I applied for the permanent, as permanent as it can be, um, position. And thankfully, I um, again got that. I wasn't long in that post when I was off myself on maternity leave. Um, and then back for another year before I went off on maternity leave again. So that was quite a difficult time. And again, the same as uh, Margie and Aurora have said, there was, you know, a few comments. It was a difficult time, but I would have to say on the whole, I was quite supported. I think I'm really lucky in the um, kind of field that I'm in. I've had quite a lot of very strong female um, mentors and support. I had seen... Um, the kind of heads of department before me were, you know, strong females with a few children. So I knew it could be done and they were quite um, supportive of me in that. So that was uh, really lucky. And yeah, so I, I've been back now. No more plans for any more maternity leave and really kind of properly, I feel, getting into the career now um, and really starting to enjoy it. Um, in terms of advice, it's actually quite um, fascinating to to hear everyone else's advice because mine's is pretty much the same. I would absolutely say that the number one thing is to f kind of find something and stick with something that you're passionate about. If you're not passionate about it, you know, you're, you're always going to kind of sit and, and doubt what you're doing and things like that. So absolutely um, something that you really enjoy. I am not the most confident person in the world. Um, if you had, if you, you know, said to somebody that I went to primary school with or high school with that I now stand in front of, you know, a class of two hundred people and and talk to them, they would never believe it. And I would say that you have to kind of push yourself into situations um, that you might not always feel comfortable with, but um, in the longer term, it does it does help. Um, it helps build that confidence. Another thing with the confidence is a lot of networking. Um, so again, that's something I'm kind of really trying to concentrate on at the minute is is the networking and kind of improving my kind of skills and career in that way. So yeah, that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Shanine. That was really helpful. And thanks to all the lecturers for sharing their stories. I'll now invite them all to turn on their cameras and we have about 15 minutes left to have a discussion and Q&A about being a woman in STEM. So I'll kick off the questions with my own. What can a young woman in STEM do if they experience sexism, especially in a study environment like Dundee University? Shall I come in here? Because probably the answer is talk to me. <laughs> if it's Dundee <laughs> University, come and see me and I can tell you I will sort it out. We haven't had very much of this at school, which is something I'm really grateful we do build into induction and in fact this year we're doing induction online and say you will not have any sexist behaviour. The only thing I'm aware of is that we once had some students who were pinging bra straps and basically I got them to my office, gave them a dressing down and told them to stop being so juvenile because I was like this is ridiculous at this, this, this age. Um, that's the only thing that I'm actually aware of. I don't think it's a major issue for our students which is something I'm very glad of but we, we want to know basically. And if you come and see me, I'll treat it confidentially and I will make sure it gets sorted. I can promise that. I would just add maybe that, you know, I think we all agree here, it should not be tolerated. And even those little comments, those little letdowns, like you only got the job because you're a woman, we should absolutely not tolerate them. So, you know, sp speak to Karen, there's a whole network that would will support you. Um, but also, we just need to all stand up for each other. So if you do hear comments like that, I think the answer probably for that one is, well, if you get it, you're only going to get it because you're a man. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, does anyone else have anything to add to that? Um, just, just maybe I think that anything that he said like that says more about the bully and the person saying it. So very often it's people who are uncomfortable with themselves. And so we need to actually have zero tolerance, but we also need to educate these people. Yeah, that's a good point. A question we got from the audience was, 
If you could go back and change something about your career journey, what would it be? I well, my, 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 my favorite footing to the previous um, comment because I didn't actually talk about the fact that I took years and years to get promoted and it was actually because people weren't seeing me as somebody who would be promoted. And it was only from outside when people kept on saying, why aren't you a senior lecturer? Or why aren't you a professor yet? So I think if I had to go back, I would have more confidence in myself in terms of being promoted and going up the academic tree. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think I'd like to strengthen what Anna Lou says. So in probably in my really darkest times at work, I sometimes actually needed to sit down. It sounds ridiculous now. And look at my CV and look at my accomplishments and tell myself, look at all I've achieved. I do belong. It doesn't matter what anybody else is telling me or whoever's bullying me. I belong. And I, I think I agree with Anna Lou here. It's that confidence to to know that you belong you know, you've earned it. Nobody's done us any favours in these jobs. You know, if we're here, we're here because we deserve these jobs and we belong. Uh, so I think I would I would second that, the confidence uh, to know that we belong. Yeah. I think I'd also add imposter syndrome is a real thing. Um, even early, So earlier today, we had what we call a town hall meeting with the vice principal and all the staff. And I suddenly realised about two minutes beforehand that in school executive group, we hadn't talked about who was going to chair this meeting and the dean was off. So I just started chairing because I thought somebody has to. But then during the whole meeting, I was thinking, am I talking too much? Am I saying too much? Should I be a bit more quiet here? And even now, as a fairly senior person, I spend a lot of my time questioning myself and thinking, am I doing the right thing? Maybe somebody else could do this better. Maybe I should have just let Dice chair. Well, was Dice even there at the start? I'm not really sure. And even now, I spend a lot of my time actually questioning myself and thinking, I'm not sure I'm doing well here. Um, and I'll be honest, I used to hope when I was younger that that would go away. It's not gone away. What's gone away is that now I recognise it. So now if I find myself saying, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, maybe I should be a bit more quiet. It's like, no, you're fine, go for it, you're okay. So I think that the confidence to recognise it and to actually push through it is something that's really changed um, as, I've, as I've gone on with my career. Did you yes. have to make another comment also? Because for me also to get confidence is one of the things that, are, that is uh, important, also especially when you're moving higher into academy. You have the issue that there are many people that are very aggressive, right? So then if you are not uh, super confident, they're going to kill you, right? So uh, I'm not sure that uh, one should react by being aggressive as well, because then otherwise we are kind of starting to work in a world of everyone is uh, biting off uh, each other, which will be very horrible, right? But I think uh, you, should, uh, you should be confident also because any sign of weakness that you show may be taken against you. And this in weakness also includes uh, any kind of time that you may take off or any kind of uh, odd path that you may follow in your career. So I think uh, being confident is, uh, is a very important point. I'll move on to the next question. Um, are there any tips on staying positive and on track when you go through setbacks on your studies or career? And also, how do you deal with situations that you see as failures but others see as achievements? And how do you stop being too hard on yourself? I'll direct this question towards Sanin or Karen M. Um, so for me personally, kind of it's, it's a lot of the time about taking a step back and kind of looking at the bigger picture again and just thinking about 
what what is it that you're trying to achieve where is it you're trying to get to and what do you have to do to get there and once you've kind of got that bigger picture back in your head because I think a lot of the time you get kind of tunnel vision and you get kind of like you say you can't see the woods for the trees type thing and you need to kind of just step back from it see the bigger picture take a deep breath and 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 go for it again and you know when I'm saying take a step back sometimes I even mean like physically like literally leave it leave it for a bit take a a week's holiday like do something completely different go out for a walk if that's what you need to do like just step back from it all um and and kind of just clear your head a little bit in terms of like um you know something that you see as a failure and other people see as you know just a kind of minor setback or things like that I would say that's something that I'm quite bad for actually like I will you know if something goes wrong or you know there's a little kind of mishap I will think about it lots and analyze it lots and think oh I should have done this I should have done that instead of just thinking you know what just learn from that you know that that's went wrong now you know the steps to take to not let it happen again and kind of and move on from that and I think um it's kind of like what Karen was saying earlier it's that hasn't gone away I still feel like that but I I know that I feel like that now and I know that I need to just stop and think do you know what it might have been a failure yesterday or this morning or whatever but it's fine I've learned from that now and I can move on and and not let it kind of affect you know the rest of the day the week the month so yeah that's that's my take on it (laughs) If anyone has anything to add to that. I may add something, you know, like sometimes things are not working in the way you will like, or you have to take a detour or, uh, or even a step back. But at the end, uh, there are a lot of things that you also learn along that way, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you need to take a step back or time off or something, it doesn't necessarily mean that... Uh, uh, it may be a failure. Um, something I'm quite interested to know is if you've noticed a distinct approach difference when it comes to studying STEM and genders when you're teaching your course. Not really. I mean, there's all the stereotypes. Um, I think the one thing I would say, and this is actually true because I did the stats a few years ago, is that in the main, females actually do better. And I think that's because they've actually really wanted to study something like computing. If you're going to be 20% of the class, you've had to fight to study computing. You've had to already fight to do the hires, to do the advanced hires, to get to that class. And so that fight is there somehow. So they do tend to get higher, higher grades, higher degree classifications. But they don't study any way any differently. They don't behave any differently. I, I don't think there's actually many differences at all. Um, and I think that's something we should celebrate. There really isn't a difference. We can we can all do it, basically. Yeah, I also have the feeling that there is no difference. It's more like a cultural issue or something that you grow in. You know, because, for instance, in Spain, being uh, finding it odd that a woman does science or physics is something that I would have put back at the time of my grandparents, right? And uh, I, when I went to the U.S., also it was sort of normal. Okay, yeah, you have less women in physics, both in Spain and in the U.S., than men, but you still have a reasonable proportion. So there is nothing weird. No, so I, it was not that until I moved to Germany that people started telling me, "Oh, how come that you went into that?" And I said, "Why not? I mean, why, well, forty percent of women in my class in university, right? It wasn't out. So there is. Uh, it's more like a cultural issue." or like a, a kind of growing into the stereotype and not like uh, something that uh, is like intrinsic. And a question I'll direct to Karen Mayer is, have you experienced discrimination due to your gender in a professional environment? And if yes, how did it affect you and how did you come over that? Um, No, I've actually been very lucky in my career. I've never experienced discrimination due to my gender. Um, I've had quite a lot of supportive 
male colleagues and supervisors um, throughout my career, but I know that's not everybody's experience. Um, maybe I can follow that up because from a gender point of view, I've never really felt any discrimination. From a disabled person's point of view, however, it's almost people's assumptions. So how do we, and this goes back to the previous question, how do we change the societal assumptions of what girls and boys are, should be doing or what disabled or non-disabled people should do. So it's this assumption of this characteristic of what we expect people to do instead of looking at the actual person and looking at what their skills, their dreams, you know, we can all dream. And how do we enable people to achieve those dreams? Maybe not in the way they thought that dream would come to fruition, but support people to actually achieve their potential. Yeah, that's amazing advice. We have time for one more short question. And I know there's been a lot of advice in here, but what advice would you give your younger self? Well, okay, I'll jump, I'll, I'll jump in first then, if that's okay. <laughs> I think um, probably so, the same that we've been discussing before. Yeah, that's uh, exactly what I was about to say. I mean, f certainly um, from my point of view, it would be a confidence thing. It's it's exactly what we've all spoke about. Um, and it seems to be a recurring theme. But, you know, absolutely. I, I You know, having more confidence I think I would have pushed myself into kind of and don't get me wrong I'm happy where I am now but um maybe could have got here a little bit sooner or you know could have taken a more direct path if I'd had that confidence and kind of pushed myself into situations or to kind of speak when um it maybe would have helped a little bit more <laughs> I also think to add to that I would say it's okay to be nice <laughs> so I don't I'd like to think that I'm quite a nice person. I try and be friendly and helpful when people ask questions and so forth. But in my younger years, I kind of felt that there was this aggression of working with, you know, these big AI professors and I had to be more aggressive. And actually, I've now realised that I can be myself more and actually it's okay to be kind. It's okay to be nice. If they don't respect you for that, that's their problem, not your problem. So now I try very much to be nice and to be kind in everything I do and all my interactions. I respect you for being nice and kind, Karen. I would say one last thing is find your supportive network. Uh, I say a big for me. Find your support network and you belong. If you're here, you belong. We all belong. I think if I had to talk to my younger self, I would have to say it's okay to be loud. And it's the understanding that there are extroverts and introverts and being aware that different people think, learn and act in a different way. And I think that awareness makes us more appreciative of people who are other than what we are. So I'm going to say Karen, because I know Karen and I are very opposite <laughs> in, in terms of extrovert introvert. So Karen, what would you say to your younger self? Karen M, sorry. 
Um, I mean, I would tell my younger self to be more confident, but I wouldn't listen to myself. <laughs> I've had that advice um, so many times over the years, and I've been told so many times over the years that everybody feels that way and it's normal. Um, but I, I think I wouldn't listen to myself. <laughs> Okay, so if we don't have anything more to say, that concludes our lecturers panel event. Thank you all for coming and for asking such great questions. Huge thank you to all the amazing lecturers for coming here today and sharing their stories and advice with us. If you haven't, be sure to follow our society social medias and join the Discord community too. And if you want to be a member, make sure you sign up when term starts. Thank you.